Time for security now. Steve Gibson is here. Lots to talk about, including a bad bug in Microsoft's internet browser, a zero day that's been exposed already, a mess up in Intel's chip that's been a problem for almost a decade, and it is a big security flaw, and a lot of more stuff like that. It's just, you know, it's a nightmare. <laughs> but we'll talk about all of it and how to protect yourself next on Security Now. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Security Now is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson. Episode 610, recorded May 2nd, 2017. Intel's mismanagement engine. Security Now is brought to you by IT Pro TV, an easy, entertaining approach to online IT training. Visit itpro.tv slash security now and use the code SN30 to get a free seven-day trial and 30% off a monthly membership for the lifetime of your active subscription. And by Zip Recruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100-plus job boards, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter free at ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. And by Sonic, Twit's 10 gigabit fiber internet service provider. Join Sonic's internet revolution as they bring fast, affordable internet, phone, and TV to homes and businesses all over California. Visit sonic.com slash twit to sign up for service and receive your first month free. It's time for Security Now, the show where we uh, cover your privacy and security online with this guy right here, Steve Gibson, the man in charge, grc.com, and our security guru since 2005. Hi, Steve. Hey, Leo. Great to be with you again for episode 610. Wow. At the beginning of May, and in fact, it was interesting that this uh, that the, our main topic occurred on May first because this is truly May Day for Intel. Oh boy! Um, the title of today's podcast is Intel's Mismanagement Engine. Um, so we're going to discuss the long expected remote vulnerability in Intel's super secret motherboard management engine technology. Uh, also, a there was a, a paper given at a European security conference, an IEEE conference, where five researchers from, I think it was the U of Michigan, I've got it in my notes, um, took a look at something no one had looked at closely before, and what they found was worrisome. And that's exploitable open ports in Android apps. Oh. Uh, we have another instance of an IoT device blowing a, su a suspect's BS timeline. <laughs> and you can just imagine when you <laughs> – the details of this are just so screwy. I'm sure are, when the police came out to investigate, they were like looking at each other going, oh, come on. We're supposed to, supposed to believe this? Uh, there are some newly discovered problems in the in the widespread ghost ghost script interpreter. Um, yet another way for ISPs to see where we go online. One that's another one that I sort of escaped my overall uh, summary, so I wanted to to mention that. There's a new bad problem in the Edge browser, which is very worrisome and was disclosed irresponsibly by an Argentinian researcher for which there's no fix and there are proof of concept exploits that allows, well, <laughs> we'll get to that, bad. Uh, Chrome is changing their certificate policy, which is interesting. There's a very large and suspiciously well-designed uh, new botnet growing in size that's being called a vigilante botnet. Um a, an interesting proposed solution to smartphone distracted driving, uh, the emergence of ransomware as a service, uh, and of course, we're, we have to talk briefly at least about the, the concerning reversal 
by this new administration on the previous administration's position on net neutrality. Uh, and uh, this is worth rallying all of our listeners and you know everyone within reach as we approach the the, the time for public opinion later this month a- after May 18th, um, because it's back on the chopping block again. Uh, there's an intriguing new service from Cloudflare for protecting IoT devices that we need to talk about, and of course remind our listeners that they are a sponsor of the of the Twit Network. Um, there's, of course, then the ongoing uh, controversy over the semantic certificate misissuance and what the browser should do to deal with it. And as if that wasn't enough, we have some fun errata, some miscellany, and then a little bit of closing the loop feedback from our terrific listeners. So, yes, <laughs> 610 and going strong. Well, we're going to take a break and we will get to those fabulous subjects in this little bit our show today brought to you by it pro tv if you're in the it business or you're or you have a uh inkling a hankering to get into the it business you've got to know about it pro tv the easiest way to prepare and learn and take the tests to get the certs to get you a great job and then to keep the skills up so you can keep that great job it pro tv is an easy and entertaining uh, approach to IT training that's kind of based on what we did. In fact, they freely admitted, Tim and Don, the founders, saw what we were doing and said, you know, we ought to do that with IT training. And now they've got five studios. <laughs> they've got continual streams going on 9 to 5 Monday through Friday, over 2,000 hours of content. They're making 125 new hours every single week. They are on fire. And by the way, couldn't be easier to watch IT Pro TV because they've got uh, apps for Chromecast, Roku, Fire TV, Apple TV, PC. So you put it up on your big screen. You can have it running all day. You can get on the road. You can listen on your phone. You can watch on your tablet or your computer. Courses include everything, everything having to do with IT, from uh, private cloud, MCSC, MCSA Server 2016. Programmers you'll love and, and scientists, intro to NumPy, the Python uh, numeric library used by uh, scientists and statisticians everywhere. Wow, they're getting to some interesting areas. Uh, coming up, Apple Certified Support Professional, CompTIA's Security Plus. They update that regularly. ITIL, Planning, Protection, and Optimization. So there's courses on business. There's courses on Six Sigma. There's courses on IT. Every one of them has a written transcript, just like Steve does with our show. So you can follow from start to finish. Some people like to see it on a page. But you can also search and find and jump to the part of the video you need. If you get the premium account, then you have the machine lab, the virtual machine labs. You don't need to have a Windows machine or a server. You can do it all in an HTML5 browser. You also get the practice exam. So if you're preparing for the cert, you really want to get the premium account. Those transcender practice exams are worth 190 bu 109 bucks just by themselves, and they really help. IT Pro TV is growing like crazy. Uh, new enterprise clients include LL Bean, Meridian Health Services, Tech Data Avnet. Philips 66, Disney, and the ABC Television Group. Take advantage of their low monthly price, their no-hassle cancellation policy. That's because if you get the cert, a lot of people say, well, I'm done, but I bet you would you will want to keep it because it, you got to keep those skills up, and there's always something new to learn at IT Pro TV. So they have two new membership plans now. They have a standard membership level, which gives you access to all the live and recorded content, and that's great if you just want to keep it up or review it or just have something really geeky running on your TV. The premium membership includes all the video content, access to the virtual labs, the Q&A forums, the, the transcender practice exams. The premium membership is actually really affordable when you apply our Security Now uh, offer. The cost is normally $85.70 a month or $857 a year. You get two months free. But if you want to try it and get a 30% off discount, go to itpro.tv slash security now. itpro.tv slash security now. Use the code SN30. You'll get a seven-day trial so you can see everything. You'll get 30% off the monthly membership. It's a great deal. itpro.tv slash security now. The offer code is SN30. They are just growing like crazy. I'm not surprised because it's a great field to get into, and they have the easiest way uh, to learn. If you like what we do here on Twit, you'll love itpro.tv. TV. On with the show, Stephen. 
So I forgot to mention that I we do have an about a two minute audio clip to okay. play. Um, oh, okay. Uh, it, it it's <laughs> it's wonderful. Right. Following on from last week's very popular Turbo and Tabulator. However, whereas that one was a bunch of mumbo jumbo gobbledygook, this is actually completely mathematically correct but wonderfully obtuse anyway it's missile guidance explained and it's just audio so there's no visual works in the podcast there's a di another one that i just tweeted out uh where about that's more like the turbo and tabulator that involves the muppets cookie monster which is Unfortunately, it's completely visual, but it is just hysterically funny. I had no idea the Cookie Monster could be so expressive. Anyway, but that's not what we're going to show. I just I put it in the show notes and I tweeted it because our, and, and you can also just Google Muppets Analytical Computer and you'll find it on YouTube. But but the but the third link from the bottom of the second page from the from the second to the last page. The missile guidance explained is just two minutes of audio that we will play when we get to it. But I wanted to give you a heads up. Um, so our picture of the week, uh, it had been in my queue. I have a backlog of pictures of the week and nothing jumped out. So I pulled this one from the from the Security Now backlog, uh, which I thought was interesting. And it's it's apropos a story that we'll be getting to about the open ports which is it's noting that uh, this shows a graph of four different OSs, Android, Windows, iOS, and OS 10 from March of 2012 through March of 2017. So essentially a month ago. So five years during which time the percentage of Windows OS drops from, it looks a little higher than 80 down to 37.91%. But during the same time, Android moves up from something that looks like around 4% up to 373 In other words, higher than Windows, more Android than Windows. And during this same time, iOS sort of putters along, slowly growing from, it looks like, a little more than Android, but now way behind. It, it drifts, it, it maybe goes up from like 5% up to around maybe 12 or 13. Uh, and OS 10 is pretty much uh, floats around below 10 and dro dropping down just a little bit. But anyway, just sort of interesting that uh, as this de graph demonstrates, Android is now the quote, the most popular, at least in terms of instances. Uh, in the world. I'm not sure I would call that popularity, but in terms of, you know, count, since uh, so many uh, devices are Android based, uh, but that's, you know, significant. And of course, it means that the, and the security of Android, as we know, is important. Okay, so this week's top story, uh, I, I titled it A True May Day for Intel. About uh, a year ago, I, I, I looked back through the transcripts uh, backlog and and I couldn't find the specific the specific podcast where we discussed this in depth, but because we've discussed it many times, we've touched on it many times. And that's the this the so-called Intel management engine, which exists in a number of different forms. There's something called IAM, which is Intel Active Management, SBT, which is Small Business Technology, and ISM, which is Intel Standard Manageability. Uh, it's been around since the uh, since like 2008 with the and I had it written down. I don't, don't 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 see it. Is is it the Kalem or uh, I can't remember which processor architecture. It's some yes, that's the Nahalem, one. Yeah. From them through KB Lake, so like up through just now, and the, the ME has had different versions. The, this Intel management engine, but but uh, versions from V6 through 11.6, which is current, uh, are the area of concern. The problem, and as we discussed it before, is that this cannot be turned off. 
You, there's no way to disable it. You, you can't turn it off in the BIOS. There's that you can enable additional features, but the baseline set of features just there's just no getting around it. It's it's um, it's a separate ARC ARC processor that actually runs in one of the Intel, ch you know, uh, one of the Intel chipset components that surrounds the main Intel processor. To, to, to does all the memory management and I/O glue and and slot management and so forth, providing USB and and PCI functions and you know BIOS and and all of that. Um, it's always running. Intel has gone to tremendous lengths to keep it a secret, so it's not open. It's never been subject to scrutiny. People have been for years worried about it and chipping away at it. But as we discussed previously at length, you know, Intel did it like used er every trick in the book to, to hide what this is. And, and that alone is a concern. The idea that there is something in all motherboards for the last nine years from 2008 on, which is outside of all non-Intel scrutiny. The protocol is not documented. It's available under NDA and has been licensed to like three companies. Unfortunately, one of them is Symantec. Let's hope they can do a better job with that than they have with certificate issuance. Um, so there are a few companies that provide enterprise access functionality that allow enterprises to manage their deploy their deployed machines throughout the enterprise. So not just servers, but laptops, desktops, tablets, anything essentially with an with an Intel chipset for nearly the past decade. And in fact, our listeners will remember that I was pulling my hair out for a couple of weeks. I put a I put a I was bringing up a new Intel based 2U server about a year ago and it was causing a, 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 over at the level 3 data center and I was getting these IP address conflicts. I was there was an ARP storm and and interfaces were fighting each other and I just nothing I could do. I couldn't turn it off. I couldn't figure out what was going on. Finally, when I, because those these machines have multiple LAN interfaces, when I moved it from LAN one to LAN two, that is away from the primary NIC, all of that went away. And I remember when we were discussing all this at the time, uh, verifying that only the primary NIC on multi NIC motherboards has this this. IME interface and that what you what anyone could do would be to switch to a secondary or tertiary anything but the primary NIC and you would be okay because there's otherwise no way to turn this off. Well, the other shoe is dropped and we now have a confirmed exploit. I mean, this is what what everybody was worried about. Um, and this is as bad as it gets because unlike OS, uh, you know, current versions of OSs themselves and to an even degree, greater degree browsers and to some degree even apps, the motherboard BIOS, while there may be patches available, there isn't an auto patching mechanism. And even though and only enterprises really need or use this, this is the conundrum, is it's on and cannot be disabled in through any means. So, and I, I know while I was putting all this together, I dug into the background thinking, you know, is there a scanner? Is there is there some way we that we could check? The problem is this is the problem with anything that is secret and proprietary and rigorously undocumented is 
nobody knows anything about this except we we now have a confirmed exploit this uh, there were, i found one site where some guy for years has been pounding on Intel, telling them this is a problem, and they've apparently just been ignoring him. That's what's but, really frustrating, is that this is yes. known. Yes. For years. Yes. That's yes. really frustrating. And Intel's just, oh, that's not a problem. That's not a problem. Uh, so suddenly it's May Day. They have they have issued just yesterday on May 1st, 2017. Patches for all of their firmware through, through for all of these motherboards. And while that's the good news, the problem is there are all, I mean, like I've got, I, I just found, I just checked my, my Lenovo X1 Carbon. It's got it and it's in there and it's running and I don't want it. But, you know, so... So it'll be one it, as soon as I'm through with the podcast, I will see about what whether and I'll I'll talk about it next week. What I find, then I'll check GRC Security Now News Group because I'm sure that our that, that the people there will will be interested in finding out how, whether there are firmware how, updates for how their could systems. You patch this because uh, isn't this in hardware? I mean, no, it it is it is. I mean, it's it's deep firmware is probably the way to describe it. So it there are versions and they do they do have patches, but there is no and, and an enterprise could could deploy these patches. But but just so people understand, this is this is a root kit. As I mean, this that's the best way to describe it. Um, it, from my notes, I wrote, recent Intel x86 processors implement a secret, powerful control mechanism that runs on a separate chip that no one is allowed to audit or examine. When these are eventually compromised, they'll expose all affected systems to nearly unkillable, undetectable rootkit attacks. Um, uh uh, and and the guy I'm quoting said, I've made it my mission to open up this system and make free open replacements before it's too late. And that's what we we talked about this last year. There there was there is a project to 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 replace this with publicly available open source solution. Um, the, the, this guy goes on. The Intel management engine is a subsystem composed of a special 32-bit ARC microprocessor that's physically located inside the chipset. It's an extra general purpose computer running a firmware blob that is sold as a management system for big enterprise deployments. When you purchase your system with a main board and Intel x86 CPU, that is to say with an Intel chipset, you are also buying this hardware add-on an extra computer that controls the main CPU. This extra computer runs completely out of band with the main x86 CPU, meaning that it can function totally independently even when your main CPU is in a low power state like S3, suspend. On some chipsets, the firmware running on the ME implements a system called Intel's Active Management Technology. This is entirely transparent to the operating system, which means this extra computer can do its job regardless of which operating system is installed. So it doesn't mean Windows. It could be Linux. It could be, you know, or, or like no OS if it's just sitting there waiting to be deployed. But it gets worse. The purpose of AMT is to provide a way to manage computers remotely, this is similar to an older system called Intelligent Platform Management Interface, IPMI, but this is more powerful than that. To achieve this task, the ME is capable of accessing any memory region without the main x86 CPU knowing about the existence of these accesses. I mean, it is a classic hardware backdoor. It also runs a TCIP server on your network interface and packets entering and leaving your machine on certain ports bypass any firewall. 
running on your system. You This cannot be blocked by anything that you do running on top of it. While AMT can be great value add, it has several troubling disadvantages. ME is classified by security researchers, and this is what we talked about at the time, as ring minus three. You know, it's, you know, no, normal apps run at plus three. Ring zero is the OS. Well, this is way beneath the OS. <laughs> I didn't even know there was a ring negative <laughs> ring. Ring minus three. Rings of security, he writes, can be defined as layers of security that affect particular parts of a system with a smaller ring number corresponding to an area closer to the hardware. For example, ring three threats are defined as security threats that manifest in user space mode. Ring zero threats occur in kernel level. Ring minus one threats occur in a hypervisor level. One level lower than the kernel, ring minus two threats occur in a special CPU called SMM. That's system management mode, a special mode that Intel CPUs can be put into that runs a separately defined chunk of code. And if attackers can modify the SMM code and trigger the mode, they can get arbitrary execution of code on the CPU. But that's the main CPU. And this is minus three, even below that. So, okay, so Intel rates this, their own problem, as critical, remotely exploitable. I would love to know what external vulnerability this represents but this is part of the problem the information is so blacked out that i could find nothing about how to scan for it how to detect it how, i mean how, like anything but but here's the concern is that systems will not update themselves unlike browsers and os's and many apps the BIOS doesn't. You normally need to go get it. Now, people like Lenovo, who have tried to integrate system management, controversial as it is, I would imagine that that if you are using the Lenovo, keep your system up to date. I know that it does BIOS updates. I've had because I'm I've been a long time ThinkPad and then a, a Lenovo user. I imagine that they could use that mechanism to push that out. But if you've just got, in the last nearly a decade, any Intel system uh, um, that has this IME, the Intel Management Engine technology in it, then um, we don't really have a way of gauging. You know, you, you know, I, I don't want to run around hair on fire screaming well, if, that the sky I is mean, falling. There's mitigation if you don't use a Intel, the built-in network, but, but use your own network card you're safe right correct correct uh, yes if you uh and i you know it has to be these managed computers it's in every intel chip but i don't it's it's not i don't it was my sense it wasn't in the management engine wasn't enabled unless you have a managed system no that's not correct that's not it's correct. absolutely okay. is absolutely enabled um okay. i'm sure and now one, one thing you can do um, on Windows machines, if you l browse through your list of services, and I did this on my Win 7 uh, X1, and there it was, Intel Management Engine, a service running. And that's the other problem, is that this is also vulnerable to local exploit, not just remote exploit. So you because have, Intel says you have to have vPro technology for this, which is not all Intel chips. Correct. And and good. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yes, that is right. Um, uh, Wikipedia's page has already been updated. It was updated immediately uh, to, to be to be current about this. Uh, th they write currently AMT is available in desktop servers, ultrabooks, tablets and laptops with Intel Core V Pro processor family, including Intel Core i3, i5, i7, and the Xeons. But that, but that V Pro was sold as an enterprise system. So, I mean, I know, I'm sure it's on your ThinkPad X1 Carbon because that's an enterprise computer, but I bet you right. a lot of... I mean, I wouldn't assume... For instance, 
I have a Mac with an inhalum processor. I don't. I would assume, or actually with a Xeon as well. I would assume it's not enabled there because those are not V Pro systems. Well, okay, so we probably need to not use the word enable. It's e it, if Available. it's present, right, 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 right. right. If it's present, it's on because it, we can't turn it off, unfortunately. Um, but 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 right. So maybe it's just not there. Um, uh, I've got a bunch of links at the bottom of this about um, th there is a, something uh, you can Google Intel Management Engine Verification Utility. I found ah, that. Ah, there you go. It's dated 2010, and Intel's page says it supports XP through Win 7. I'm sure it runs on Win 10 because Win 10 will run will run things that Win 7 does. So Google Intel Management Engine Verification Utility. It's a small little. It's about half a meg, 500 and some k, a zip file containing six files. You can run that, and and so so that that will check your machine locally to see if you have the Intel management engine present, uh, and it confirmed that my my X1 Carbon did. Uh, How to Geek has an article, how to remotely control your PC even when it crashes. Um, where that they was, go, that's the point of the management engine. Correct. It, it's, it's an enterprise feature designed for the IT department to manage your system remotely. Right. So it's and, not and nefarious also, that it exists. It's just... Oh, no, no. And, and I never meant to explain it. The problem is it's it's... You know, it, uh, Intel w was absolutely secretive, right. and this it was always a concern. Always, that if especially was, in the open source community, they hated that this thing existed. Right. And just a, you don't, you know, you buy an open source system, you build an open, and you still have some proprietary blob that you can't examine. And now exactly. all of their fears are proven true. Correct. Terrible. And then the last link is uh, it, it's an Intel community site titled How to Find Intel vPro Technology-Based PCs. And unfortunately, it's not a simple way, but but that link, uh, also in the show notes, will it takes you, I think there are like four different ways you can check your system to see whether it's whether it has vPro technology and thus uh, has this uh, ME component. And bottom line is, um, it would be good to look for any firmware updates, you know, you know, it's not something we all do all the time. I mean, and, and, and you know, even the firmware documentation generally says, uh, unless there's you like, unless you are actually having a problem that, you know, this firmware will fix, uh, you know, better just to leave well enough alone. Uh, in this case, if you've got the problem, it's uh, again, because it's so under documented, I can't gauge how exploitable this is. I don't know, for example, um, what traffic the this is sniffing on the primary NIC on a motherboard to know whether, like, how um, how a remotely um, how a remote exploit would be affected. Because, for example, if it were some obscure port. And it had to come in on an obscure port, or if it was an obscure protocol. I mean, it could be anything that works in an intranet. I don't even know if it's for sure that it's routable. I mean, that's the problem. Is that there? It's just it's a big black box. But now we know Intel is calling it a critical, remotely exploitable vulnerability. And so, are there exploits that we know of? Um, no. Uh, as far as we know, it's been done. Now, I did run across anecdotal supposition, uh, but again, that's just all it is. Uh, you know, we call that now fake news, I guess, in this era. Um, but there are people who are claiming that this has been exploited, but without evidence. So I ignore that because, because you know, Intel really did try to, to, to you know, to – tighten this down you i believe you have to have a a certificate that the that the that the intel management engine recognizes so traffic needs to be signed it is encrypted over and and secured with, with tls so i mean th there it looks like the bar is very, very likely very high On the other hand you know intel has called this critically remotely exploitable so 
hopefully, I mean, it's good news that they're they're finally responding. I wish I could gauge its true exploitability for our listeners, but there's just no information. So uh, I'll, I will certainly be looking for more. This just happened yesterday. So, I mean, again, as you said, Leo, even though a number of researchers have been saying to Intel, you know, tell us about this. And and several people have been saying, uh, in fact, the, the first of at the very end of this report, I have a site is semi-accurate dot com, which is not <laughs> the most encouraging Only domain name. Accurate, yeah. <laughs> not the most encouraging domain name, but. Uh, and, the, and, and the page is Remote Security Exploit 20, 2008 Intel Platforms. Uh, it is is in the URL at semiaccurate.com. Uh, and this guy just rakes them over the coals, saying that he's been pounding on them forever to, to like, fix this, telling them, and they've just been ignoring him. So, anyway, uh, I will I, – I, I have – some some new one U Intel servers uh, that I will be deploying. There, the the one that I've already got in place is all, is got its own f- external physical hardware firewall because it's where I will will be bringing up our the the public uh, GRC forums to support Squirrel. They're actually they've been online for almost a year now, but I haven't taken them public yet, and I. And so it's already protected, but I mean, I'm it, it is an Intel motherboard, and it's a state-of-the-art chipset, so I'm sure it's got this. And I will be uh, updating its BIOS before before it sees the light of day. And it's just it's just frustrating for a, a researcher to be kept in the dark by something that looks like it's really important. Because how do you mitigate this if you if you know nothing about it? Uh, but. All, all we can do is respond by updating our BIOSes, and uh, and wow, uh, hopefully I, I don't know. This this needs to be a lesson somewhere about about the danger of absolutely black black boxes. Well, it's an opportunity it, at this point for AMD, and I hope AMD takes advantage of this. There's been some uh, uh, encouragement for AMD to make sure that their uh, new Ryzen processors are core boot, Libre boot compatible. Uh, don't have they don't have this management engine don't have any you know unknown blobs um, and I think a lot of people certainly in the free software space would be yeah. jumping on board could be very good for AMD I would uh, disappointing disappointing yeah yeah so okay <laughs> speaking of disappointing um, a, a five researchers at the University of Michigan have published their research, which went public last week uh, during the IEEE European Symposium on Security and Privacy. The research paper, and I've got a link in the show notes to the PDF. It's like a 17-pager. It it's, goes on and on. But titled, Open Doors for Bob and Mallory. I, I should mention, we talked about Alice and Bob as being the the standard characters that are used to to sort of in schematic form to talk about two parties communicating securely. Well, Mallory, by convention, is the man in the middle, thus man and Mallory. So M for Mallory. Um, and so this is open doors for Bob and Mallory, open port usage in Android apps and security implications. And I'll just share their abstract where they pull all of this, the 17 pages down into the, 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 the kernel, but summarizes beautifully what they found. They write, open ports are typically used by server software to serve remote clients. Of course, we know that. And the usage historically leads to remote exploitation due to insufficient protection. You know, can anyone see, say, Mirai Botnet? Of course, that's, you know, open ports at, or, you know, Windows printer and file sharing. Um, smartphone operating systems inherit the open port support, but since they are significantly different from traditional server machines in performance and availability guarantees, little is known about how smartphone applications use open ports and what the security implications are. In this paper, 
we performed the first systematic study of open port usage on mobile platforms and their security implications. To achieve this goal, we design and implement OP Analyzer, a static analysis tool which can effectively identify and characterize vulnerable open port usage in Android applications. Using OP Analyzer, we perform extensive usage and vulnerability analysis on a data set with over 100,000 Android applications. OP Analyzer successfully classifies 99% of the open of the mobile usage of open ports into five distinct families. And from the output, we're able to identify several mobile specific usage scenarios such as data sharing in physical proximity. In our subsequent vulnerability analysis, we find that nearly half of the usage is unprotected and can be directly exploited remotely. From the identified vulnerable usage, we discover 410 vulnerable applications with 956 potential exploits in total, so just shy of a thousand exploits. We manually confirmed the vulnerabilities for 57 applications, including popular ones, with between 10 and 50 million downloads on the official market, and also an app that is pre-installed on some device models. These vulnerabilities can be exploited to cause highly severe damage, such as remotely stealing contacts, photos, and even security credentials, and also performing sensitive actions, such as malware installation and malicious code execution. We have reported these vulnerabilities and already um, got acknowledged by the application developers for some of them. We also propose countermeasures and improve practices for each usage scenario. To get an initial estimate on the impact of these vulnerabilities in the wild, we performed a port scan in our campus network and immediately found a number of mobile devices in two minutes, which were potentially using these vulnerable apps. We've reported these vulnerabilities to the relevant parties through the vulnerability tracking systems, and they've now got registered CVE and CERT uh, registrations. Some of them have been acknowledged. We encourage readers to view several short attack video demos, and there's a, a site that I had the links for here in the show notes. In, in the show notes. So finally, under their threat model, there are three ways these, these can be attacked. They said the threat to an app with open ports comes from the attackers with the ability to reach these ports. In the design of popular smartphone operating systems such as Android, ports are reachable from both the same device, for example, another app or a script on the web page, and another host in the same network with the victim device. Thus, compared to the majority of previously reported smartphone app vulnerabilities that only consider the threat from on-device malware, open port apps additionally face threats from network attackers, in other words, the local network attacks, and web attackers, meaning malicious scripts, scripts which is much more diverse and also of wider range. More specifically, in this paper, we, can, we consider the following three adversaries, malware on the same device, a local network attacker, and malicious scripts on the web. And I'll just note that they write, when a victim user visits an attacker-controlled website using their mobile device, malicious scripts running in the handset's browser can explore delivered through an ad can exploit the vulnerable open ports on the device by sending network requests, which doesn't require permission. 
For each of these three threat models, we have prepared short attack video demos on our website to help readers more, more concretely understand their practical exploitation. And so, so if we hearken back to Fire Sheep, remember that the, the, the scenario there was in an, an unencrypted Wi-Fi environment, such as, for example, the often used Star, Starbucks example. Um, what, was, what Fire Sheep allowed was it, it was doing promiscuous sniffing of all the network traffic and parsing the non-encrypted, that is the HTTP transactions. Any query that, for example, a browser that was at the time, back then, logged into Facebook using HTTP, the, in order to maintain the persistent login, they, the session cookie was sent with every browser query back to Facebook. So a passive sniffer of network traffic could grab that cookie and log in, essentially clone the logged in session by itself sending that cookie and they would be logged in as someone. So that's what Fire Sheep did. It was called Fire Sheep because it was a plugin that ran on Firefox that just it was freaky. If you if you ran Fire Sheep at Starbucks, down the left hand column would come up the the identities of people surrounding you in the coffee shop and you could click on one of them and be logged in as them. So those ta those days changed because pretty much now all of those major services are HTTPS exclusively and so all of those all of that traffic is encrypted. What this means so so relative to that now we have a situation where Android apps running on Android devices are, in many cases, opening up listening ports for whatever reason. And they're often open and left open and are vulnerable. So, so a port scan within a non-encrypted Wi-Fi environment like Starbucks will find those open ports and can often identify the apps and then exploit them. In other words, you know, we're always talking about how our contemporary desktop OSs now always have a firewall between the between the the OS and the external internet. And so we have that line of defense. Then we also have a NAT router that we're behind. So, so that allows machines in the network to, to in, in, in the, in, in the private network to communicate with each other. But we're, but both the local firewall and the NAT router protect us from the public internet. The, the concern here is that it turns out that and what these researchers found is a substantial number of Android apps are opening ports, which are then vulnerable to local scan. And f in order to provide their functionality, they are not firewalled. You, that now you'll still be protected within your local network by the NAT router that bridges you to the public network, but this is still a large attack surface. So uh, anyway, I'm glad these guys did the research and have brought it to everyone's attention. I once, I'm sure I talked to you, Leo, about how annoyed, how annoyed I was that iOS didn't make it easy for me to move things back and forth, but, but between my my like my desktop or my windows based desktop and an ios device i found an app which is exactly like this which brings up a a web server 
or an FTP server. Actually, in this case, I, I, I use it as an FTP server. And I've got it now on several of my iOS devices. I, of course, because I'm very security conscious, I always make sure to turn it off when I'm not using it so that it closes that port. But it's very handy. I, I fire it up. I, I like if I want to I want to just grab a big a big photo, for example, without having to like email it to myself because you know I don't have iMessage under Windows, so I can't message it to myself. So I'll I'll turn this little server on, put the photo in it, and then and then I can I have an a, a, a shortcut that allows my browser to immediately bring up the FTP server that the iPad is now hosting, and I can just click on it and suck the file right over. So, and so this is one of those apps. There is an Android app. It, it is a Wi-Fi file sharing utility. And the problem is it that port is open and makes this app vulnerable. And as we know, there it's on, you know, the first level is access to the server. But then what we find is that the servers are not themselves secure. So even if the server was password protected and trying to only offer limited things, um, unless the, I mean there's a there's a I would argue, unless it's been pounded on, there's all it's almost sure to have some mistake made that could, could that could convert this into either denial of service, you know, crashing the app, maybe the phone, depending upon where the server is running, how how down, how deep in the kernel that 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 um, the uh, service is, um, or maybe give someone access to even more data. And these researchers apparently were able to do that. So I, I, um, I guess the takeaway for our listeners is if you're aware that you are running any device like this, uh, that, that is any app in, a, in an Android-based device, be sure to turn it off. Disable it when you're not actively using it. Very much the same way we've always been saying, you know, turn off Bluetooth uh, unless you need it on. It's been a constant annoyance, annoyance that every time my uh, Apple updates iOS, they turn it back on again. And so it's like turning it off if you just don't need it. It saves power and also reduces your attack surface. And for people who are uh, a little more technically savvy and curious, there are, and we've talked about them before, local port scanners, which so you could, if you looked at, you, you, you could use, turn your Android device on, um, determine what its local LAN IP is, that will be a 192.168.something.something .something .something typically. And then from a different machine, you could run a local port scan, scan all 64K, you know, 65535 ports of that IP from, from your machine and see if you find anything open. The scan, scan shouldn't take long, but it, it would give you an idea of what ports your that Android device has open. And then what's important to remember is that if those ports are open wherever you go. So as you as you roam around and the device connects to various networks, um, all of those ports are exposed. So doing a local port scan of an Android smartphone probably uh, – this research would suggest is very worthwhile. If nothing else, if it shows nothing open, then you know you have the 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 peace of mind of knowing that. Uh, but if it surprises you, you'll want to find out what apps are opening what and for why. Because if you can if you can reach them from a a machine through Wi-Fi, anybody else can. Anytime you're connected to a non-encrypted network. And probably even a, a, a network you have to log into, although it wouldn't be as easy a, as doing a passive scan. You'd have to work a little, a bad guys have to work a little harder. But this looks like a potentially big nugget. And I need a coffee. <laughs> I, I was done. I sensed that. <laughs> and probably says, I know what you're thinking. I need caffeine. Steve will be back with more in just a moment. But first, a word from our fine sponsor. This portion of the uh, Security Now show brought to you by uh, Zip Recruiter. If you're in the 
enviable yet unenviable position of hiring for your company because you're the HR person or because it's your company and there's no one else to do it. You got to know about ZipRecruiter. Let's stipulate. I think this is a safe thing. The perfect person for that job opening is out there somewhere. I mean, there's millions of job seekers out there in the United States right now. The One of them's got to be just right for that job. And you know, probably many more are terrible for that job. You don't want to hire the wrong person. That's just setting up a disaster. But if you could get that right person, man, everybody would be so happy. What's the best way to reach them? Well, you could go and post to every single job board in the nation. I wouldn't do that. I would do ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter lets you post to 100-plus job sites with a single click, including social networks like Facebook and Twitter. You're maximizing your reach, reaching out to candidates in any city, any industry, anywhere in the country. You post it once, and you watch the applications roll in. And because they're going to, you know, they're a job site themselves, ZipRecruiter, they're going to have uh, millions of resumes to match right away. So you're literally, in the first 24 hours, going to get... All these applicants. Now, you might say, well, I don't want people calling me. and I don't want all those hundreds of applications in my inbox. Don't worry. That's not how it works. It goes right into the ZipRecruiter interface. And that makes it so easy for you. You just go to your ZipRecruiter account. They've pre-formatted all the resumes so they're uniform and easy to read. You can supply screening questions, too. Yes, no, true, false, a, you know, multiple choice. So you can, you can literally, you know... If you've ever been convicted of grand larceny, you can, you can screen out the people you don't want, narrow, hone in on the ones you do, rank them, and pick the right person fast. It is an amazing process. I know because we've used it here, and I know you're going to want to try it. So we've set up a free trial for you right now. For big or little businesses, it's been used by many of the Fortune 100, but also by plenty of businesses, mom and pop businesses like mine, medium-sized businesses. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. And you could try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. If you are hiring, maybe you're not hiring today. Remember this, though. You will want to use it. It's just the best way. Let technology take over, right? ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. All right, Steve Arino, I have your audio lined up for whenever you want that, by the way. Okay, we'll get to it in a yes. few minutes here. Yes. Okay, so... We talk, we've had some fun talking several times about how IoT devices are, in some cases, uh, I guess ratting out would be the expression, their owners or their, their users. We had that case where there was some strange death in a hot tub and the, the owner of the house claimed to have no knowledge of what was going on, yet his IoT-enabled water meter – showed some huge amount of water consumed between 2 and 3 a.m., presumably to wash the blood away. And so as a consequence of that, and of course, and we've also talked in terms of like, you know, uh, law enforcement wanting to get subpoenas for anything that the uh, the Amazon uh, Echo device may, may have overheard and so forth. Well, we have... This one's Another wild. one. This one is it, wild. It is so bizarre. So, and, and and this is where I was saying at the top of the show that the the, the law enforcement officials, are presumably the the police who showed up to respond, you know, to a nine one one call, had to have just been eyeing each other. Like, how how dumb does this guy think we are? So, uh, as I understand it, and I'm not going to go through the whole story. The, I've got the link here. Uh, uh, Sophos covered this in their Naked Security blog. Um, and the the punchline is that a, that a man's wife was murdered, shot by his 357 Magnum, which he had purchased some time before. Their marriage had apparently been under stress for some time. They had two sons. Um, uh, they weren't getting along. Apparently, he was taking money from her accounts. He had a girlfriend on the side who, and he said to her that he, that he would be leaving his wife. Um, he was, when the police arrived responding to the 911 call, which he placed, one arm and one leg 
were zip tied to the chair or a chair and his other arm as i pictured it was somehow zip tied like a, up to his neck and it's like okay is this is it not obvious that he did this to himself but <laughs> i guess i know, can't move i can't move <laughs> well except for this yeah. arm and, his and leg. he tells he tells a story about a large six foot two oh. hooded camo wearing intruder who who was the perp behind all of this skullduggery? Um, a- anyway, the point of all this is that so he outlines all of this, and then the police tap into you know social media and look for any any other evidence, and it turns out that his wife was wearing her Fitbit because she was planning on going out, I think it was yoga or exercise of some sort, that morning. And so it, of course, recorded, as the Fitbit does, all of her movements. And the it and what the 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 time stamped record that they were able to recover contradicted the husband's version of events by more than an hour. Like there was a complete disparity in the timeline. Uh, so anyway, yes, uh, <laughs> I guess people attempting to perpetrate crimes are going to have to be very careful about what IOT devices, whether they're, you know, baby monitors or Fitbits or anything, which is uh, monitoring the environment. Not as easy as it once was to get away with stuff. No, and there's cameras everywhere and <laughs> golly, it's just a lot harder yeah. than it used to be. So um, there is a one of our constant themes on the show is the problems with interpreters, how surprisingly but almost understandably difficult it is to for interpreters to be secure. The 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 media interpreters, uh, image interpreters, you know, all, all of these fancy formats we have are interpreted, meaning that the, like, you know, e- e- even the old TIFF, the tagged image file format, well, it's composed of modules with tags, which label what the module contains. And so an interpreter displays a TIFF image or a PNG or a GIF or a JPEG or an MPEG or an MP3. You know, the MP3 it is is a compressed it's compressed by having a representation of the audio which is then an mp3 player reads that representation and reconstructs a an approx an audio approximation of the original sound so a classic 28 year old interpreter i mean not quite as old as spinrite but it's <laughs> it's been around 28 years since 1988 is ghost script and it turns out that there are some serious problems in ghost script the security advisory that i could find this has just happened so i have it hasn't sort of per, it hasn't percolated out through all of the various places where ghost script is in use but i mean it is the go to standard postscript and pdf interpreter which reads that those high level page descriptions and converts them into a raster image for display or printing um and so the 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 specific vulnerabilities that i saw affected essentially all recent versions of ubuntu from 12.04 lts all the way up through 17.04 so if you're an Ubuntu user, the, the danger is, as with as we've also often talked about with Adobe PDFs, there's a, another classic, you know, P, the, the Adobe Reader. How many years of material has this podcast had thanks to Adobe's PDF problems? Well, um, turns out GhostScript, m- you know, may be entering the, 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 the same sort of zone of, of having lots of problems. A researcher... Camille Frankowitz took a close look at the latest release and discovered multiple significant vulnerabilities. Um, it 
GhostScript improperly handles parameters to the RSD params and EQ proc commands, which allow an attacker, much as exactly as was the case with Adobe's PDF reader, to deliberately craft malicious documents that could disable OS protections and thereby allow and enable execution of arbitrary code or, if they're not quite slick enough, cause a denial of service. That is, cause the application to crash. To, to crash. He found use after free vulnerabilities in the color management module of GhostScript, which could also at least cause a, a, a denial of service application crash. He found the divide by zero error in the scan conversion code in GhostScript, um, which an attacker could again leverage, and multiple null pointer dereferencing errors, which again could be leveraged for attack. So, you know, this is the advantage of open source. As we know, open source doesn't automatically, magically make something more secure, but if, but it, it at least enables someone to examine the code and find problems. This, of course, is the problem with IME, Intel's management engine, is they've, they've chosen to keep it closed and protect it to an insane level so that it, you can't even reverse engineer it. It's all encrypted and it decrypts on the fly, you know, into RAM and in order to run in this hidden 32-bit ARC processor. So so th there's like, here's two different examples. So n neither open nor close specifically says whether or not it's secure, but with something like GhostScript, which is open source, if somebody takes the time to look at it, to carefully read the code, and the people who wrote it can't do it. It's just it's a it's a fundamental law of the universe. You just cannot see errors in your own code. It's got it. You have to have somebody else look at the code, wanting to find problems, and they just reveal themselves to somebody who's who's sufficiently skilled in in finding these kinds of security vulnerabilities. You know, a, a Tavis, Ormandy sort of guy. So anyway, I would say Ubuntu users. Be on the lookout for updates to GhostScript and anyone else, any probably any variant of Linux. Um, Debian had a problem with the licensing change because GhostScript has been has been taken under the wing of someone who uh, who's moved the the GhostScript code from pure GPL to a uh, a a variant of that that I know that Debian had a problem with, but I would imagine it's still prevalent and it's not clear whether these were newly introduced or whether they've been longstanding. But I, I mean, it is the case that the oldest Ubuntu 12.02 LTS uh, was subject to this. So I, I would just say to our listeners, if you are, if you know that you've got GhostScript around, if you're a Linux user and you're able to display PDFs, it's certainly GhostScript, which is the the the, the display interpreter, unless you're running a, a version of Adobe's uh, PDF for Linux. Um, it's worth checking out. Um, following up on our podcast from a few weeks ago on all the various ways that the information leaked and we talked about you know the, the what what a vpn could do what what cookies were doing uh th for first party versus third party and so forth somebody a few weeks ago and i put this in my notes and unfortunately i, I can't give credit to him because it got away from me but thank you uh for reminding me that um that server name indication sni which is an extension that was added to SSL and TLS way back in 2003 is an, is yet another way that where we are going on the internet can escape. Uh, we've talked about SNI in the context, not of a, of, of a privacy concern, but as a feature enhancement in the past, the way servers traditionally operated, they wanted to bring up HTTPS connections or generically, more broadly, SSL or now TLS connections. 
is at the server side, you would bind a the server's security certificate to an IP so that any connection on that IP would be would be would be secured under that the the certificate bound to that interface to to that IP um so so essentially the IP represented that domain that the certificate covered the problem of course arose where you wanted multiple hosting you wanted multiple domains all served from a single IP so in order to to accommodate that an extension needed to be added to the client hello packet that is the first packet going to the server after the TCP, the underlying TCP connection is brought up, then the client, the, the, like typically the user's web browser, when it, it says, it sends the, the client hello packet, uh, which among other things, lists all of the, the, the SSL or TLS protocols that it supports. And remember, so that allows the server to look at the ones it knows and hopefully choose the best one from among those that they have in common. And so then the server hello goes back to the client saying, this is the one I've chosen. And then the client in the client hello also has a nonce, a big random number, and the server also chooses one. And so they exchange their their, their nonces and that allows them then to negotiate a key and so forth. Well, part of the, in the updated spec, part of the, the addition in the client hello, the first packet the client sends is the SNI, the server name indication, which now all browsers, e even the popular WGET, WGE tool, command line file retriever tool, it knows about it. Everything knows about it for years now. It's been in all browsers for up to 11 years. Um, that packet has to be in plain text. It is not encrypted. It can't be encrypted because it's before the encrypted tunnel is brought up. In fact, that packet, and by, by reading the server name indication out of the client hello, a multiple domain, a multiply hosted server can then choose which certificate to respond with based on the name, the domain name that is in that packet. So unfortunately, it's unencrypted, can't be encrypted, it's in plain text, and anybody sniffing traffic, even when everything else is encrypted, an ISP, you know, we, we did talk about how an ISP could even, even if you were encrypted, could see what your IP was. Well, it turns out that yes, not only that, but in the client hello packets, which are, labeled brightly so that servers are able to to understand them an isp could capture those and look at the sni the server name indication in every outgoing client hello and see which domain you're going to so they didn't even have to do reverse dns and they don't have a problem with multiply hosted sites not not knowing which site you're going to at an ip because the client hello tells them so I was that, that's I just wanted to add that to and thanks to our listener for reminding me that server name indication is yet another way that our privacy leaks uh, d despite everything we want to do. And there's no solution for that. All, all you could do would be to VPN yourself past your ISP's view and then let your traffic out onto the Internet uh, in some public location where you're you're not worried about it being uh, captured and, and looked at. Okay, now um, here's another. <laughs> this is this is this is the week of bad problems for some reason. Uh, May Day. Um, uh, yeah, this is really bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad he can't even say it. Microsoft Edge browser has a vulnerability, believe it or not, that is not patched that was not disclosed responsibly that allows arbitrary sites that you visit 
to steal your cookies and passwords for other sites. Well, that's kind of a flaw. I'm not, I know. That's why I'm breathless. A serious same origin policy bypass. We've talked many times about how crucial it is that browsers honor the same origin policy. That's the idea that that code running in like that came from a certain domain cannot just arbitrarily go look at some other domain. Uh, it's able to go make other requests of its own domain, that is, the, of its own origin, the same origin, but not others. So the 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 sandboxing with of with of within origin sandboxing is crucial. So this security researcher, he's like focuses on browser security. And in fact, his domain is called brokenbrowser.com. He's found in the past some more than 500 vulnerabilities in browsers and gleefully reports them. This is, his name is Manuel Caballero, based in Buenos Aires. Um, and apparently he has no interest in responsible disclosure. Doesn't seem to be any... <laughs> <laughs> no, no concern given to it. He, um, he has posted proof of concept exploits. He's got videos demonstrating it. Uh, this affects Microsoft's, you know, uh, premier edge browser for which there is no current patch. And, uh, uh, <laughs> again, I'm sort of speechless. It can be, this vulnerability can be exploited to allow an attacker to obtain a user's password and cookie files for their other online accounts. It leverages some mistakes Edge's developers made in the handling of so-called domainless pages, such as about colon blank. About colon blank is a domainless page. And it turns out that, that there have been problems in the past that Edge has fixed, and this guy found another one, a way around the, the previous fixes. So it feels like there's a fundamental architectural mistake that was made in web, in, in, in the Edge's design, which they have now been patching because this just shouldn't be a problem. And he keeps finding other ways around it. So versions of proof of concept demos are hosted online at his site at brokenbrowser.com. And since you may not, and I mean, they actually work. So if you go there with a Microsoft Edge browser, you can sh you can have your pat your other sites your Facebook and Google and Amazon and so forth password and session cookies shown to you, but since you probably don't want to do that, he has also posted video demos which are available, and all of this is now in the public domain. He notes that the vulnerability can be customized to dump the passwords or cookies of any other online service, including Facebook, Amazon, and others. The flaw affects only Edge because universal cross-site cross scripting and same origin bypasses, as he writes, tend to be specific to individual browsers. Well, thank goodness for that, but that's this is still bad. Because... As we know, modern ads deliver JavaScript code to browsers. Attackers can leverage malvertising campaigns to automate the delivery of this exploit to thousands of victims or more. Manuel explained that attackers are able to use malvertising to push their malicious code into cheap banners shown on popular sites. If an attacker is hosted inside a Yahoo banner, and the user is logged into their Twitter account, that user can be owned with no interactions at all. And this is true, and he demonstrates it. So this is bad 
I mean, that this is like the, the flip side of responsible disclosure. Uh, it's unfortunate that this is now out in public and apparently there's no fix. The only thing I could suggest people do, um, I mean, if you're con if this is a concern, because it doesn't seem to be a workaround. I mean, look for workarounds. I will certainly mention it next week. Um, well, I don't know. Edge. I would say would yes, not use around. Edge. <laughs> I, I would, you know, switch to Chrome uh, and stay away from Edge until this Although, gets fixed. Since that's the primary rendering engine on uh, Windows 10, I wonder. I know how often it gets used without your intention. Probably an email. Yes. Right? Yes. Good point. Yeah. Very good point. <laughs> so, um, uh, what? Where are we? Where this is uh, Tuesday the second. So our our it's May patch. Yeah. Yes, our May patch Tuesday will be next Tuesday. It would be wonderful if if Microsoft ha had time to fix this by then. Th this has to have lit a fire under them because this this <laughs> this is really bad and. It sounds like it should be an easy fix. Whatever it is this guy found, I would imagine they, they can they can patch their way around it and get it fixed. And uh, let's hope they do that. <sighs> have another coffee break. Well, that's good because you know what? I have another ad. Perfect. <laughs> uh, this uh, show is brought to you in living color or, you know, stereo audio, whichever you prefer. Thanks to the good folks at Sonic, literally brought to you by Sonic, our 10 gigabit symmetric fiber connection to the outside world. Thank you, Sonic. Thank you. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. I tell you, uh, they are uh, and always have been one of the greatest internets. I'm going to say the greatest internet service provider in the country. Uh, if you have any questions about them, go to the EFF. They have an ISP rating chart for how an ISP, you know, protects your privacy, whether they have bandwidth caps, you know, how are they good? All of that stuff, just green checks. This is the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Sonic then is the ISP we all deserve. Unfortunately, we can't all get it, but if you're in California, you ought to check it out. Let me tell you what you get. Now, you're not going to get the symmetric 10 gigabit fiber. You probably don't need that. I'm sure you don't even have a machine that could take 10 gigabits. We don't, but... <laughs> Can you, you, does your machine have a gigabit card in it? You probably could do. Well, how about that? How about residential? And by the way, they do have business plans, but residential, business, fiber, or business fiber to the premise, gigabit connectivity. It's in the San Francisco Bay Area, North Bay, the East Bay. You get, it just blows me away what you get. Internet service, of course, 15 email accounts, a gigabyte of storage, Personal web hosting with a new domain and fax line service. Or, yeah, you also get a home phone connection with unlimited local and long distance calling. That's included. And download speeds of up to 1,000 megabits per second. A gigabit. A gigabit. All of that. All of that. $40 a month. This is the kind of thing everybody ought to be able to get. Unfortunately, you have to be in the right neighborhood. But if you are... Sonic stands up for privacy. They have great, friendly local customer support from just up the road a piece in Santa Rosa. No bandwidth caps. None. Unfortunately, I, I can't get Sonic Fiber in the house. We have it here. So I come in here when I want to download stuff. And by the way, it is so... Uh, you know, I should I should pull up the bandwidth... Ah, I won't do that. I won't rub it in your face in it. But it's it's amazing. It's amazing. Affordable pricing, great service, great product and customer advocacy to improve Internet in the United States. Join the Internet Revolution, Sonic, S-O-N-I-C dot com slash twit. Get your first month of Sonic Internet and phone service free. And if you bundle it with Dish, they offer that too. Save $120 on your Sonic bill. Sonic dot com slash twit. Thank you, Sonic, uh, for giving us just the best darn Internet service in the world. I'm so happy to have it. Uh, even Steve, it's so good, even Steve can't get it. <laughs> I'm jealous. I'm sure he would love it. Debug yeah, there's some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Debug in our chat room says he's a Sonic customer. He loves it. Of course they are. Yeah. They're great. Yeah. So um, Chrome has made a change to the way they handle certificates that I thought was interesting. They are deprecating in Chrome 58 their use of the 
the subject name field, which sort of call, or they it's called the 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 subject common name, which is like the way the certificate identifies itself. The problem is that the the way the common name was originally defined was never very rigorous. For example, um, I think I've got www.grc.com as my as my certificates my main certificates common name but i noticed that ever since i started using digicert they also placed it that is the www.grc.com in the the san field the subject alternative name and and traditionally the the subject alternative name as it's as its description sounds is our alternative names and this is for example how you can get one certificate from from a certificate authority which can be used on like three different domains where for example i i might have grc.com www.grc.com and media.grc.com the you would have the the common name would be one of them, and then the alternative names would be the other two. But I noted that Digicert, again, they're on top of the they're on top of their game. They were always putting all three in the subject alternative name. Well, it turns out that the industry has been souring over time over the use of the like like the the actual value in the common name as being as standing for something. So for a while, Chrome's behavior was to prefer the subject alternative name field. And but if it was missing, then to fall back to using the common name, assuming that the common name would be the domain name that was that was bound in the certificate. Although, again, it was never rigorously defined. The format wasn't defined. It, it's considered an untyped field, which makes everybody nervous, whereas the subject alternative name being more recent was rigorously defined from the start. Anyway, so the change is significant. That is, with 58, the fallback path is removed. And, this, and from now on, and this is so. This represents really a change for the industry. The common name will still be in certificates, but browsers moving forward and Firefox is on the same tra trajectory will no longer be using the common name for any for any use other than display purposes in the certificate. The browser will no longer rely on that. So. The, the reason this could affect individuals is that a popular thing to do is to generate self-signed certificates. And many of the, of the original self-signing tools do not support subject alternative name fields. They, they only self-sign and the domain that you're signing is in the common name. Well, users of those certificates will suddenly discover that Chrome no longer honors those self-signed certificates. The good news is there are newer tools for generating fully compliant certificates, but that may mean that people who have long expiration self-signed certificates are going to need to create updated certificates, which Chrome from 58 on and soon Firefox uh, will continue to honor. So just sort of an interesting, uh, again, uh, something that, that Google, I think, is doing the right thing in doing in, in continuing to move forward and, you know, clean up a little bit of, of what's been done before. We have a mystery botnet um, that's got a lot of people wondering what's going on. It's a new IoT botnet it's being, it's being called the Vigilante botnet, which has been growing rapidly. It was first spotted in October of last year, of 2016. Um, it's also known as the uh, Hajime, H-A-J-I-M-E-H. 
Hey, Jimmy. Hey, Jimmy, botnet. Hey, botnet. Uh, what's, what's puzzling people is that it is extremely well-designed and sophisticated with a robustness and feature set that surpasses its overtly malicious rivals, uh -huh. like the Mirai botnet, for example. It is expending a huge amount of effort to infect other IoT devices. But unlike Mirai, once Hey Jimmy affects <laughs> uh, an IoT device, it closes the back doors behind itself, mm. securing those devices it has infected against further attacks. It blocks access to ports 23, 7547, 555, and 5358, which are known to be the most widely used vectors for infecting IoT devices. Mm. And thus, at least temporarily, it sanitizes that device in its wake. But rather than using the more common fixed command and control server architectures that we've been talking about, Hey Jimmy employs a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network to issue updates to infected devices, making it far more difficult for the botnet to be taken down. I would argue impossible by anyone. And what's also strange is that when infected devices are also equipped with display terminals, every 10 minutes or so it displays a signed message describing its creators as, quote, just a white hat securing some systems. Uh, yeah. And then it says important messages will be signed like this. Hey, Jimmy, author, contact closed, stay sharp. Uh -huh. And it's like, okay. Uh -huh. So um, unlike Mirai and other IoT botnets, Hey, Jimmy lacks DDoS <laughs> like capability. You've adopted my pronunciation. Of, <laughs> hey, Jimmy. Hey. hey, Jimmy. Hey, Jimmy. Hey, come on over, Jimmy. Lacks DDoS capabilities and other hacking skills uh, or capabilities except for the propagation code that lets one infected IoT device search for other vulnerable devices and then infects them. Kaspersky's security researchers noted that, quote, the most intriguing thing about Hey Jimmy <laughs> is its purpose. <laughs> while the botnet, it never gets old, while the botnet <laughs> is getting bigger and bigger. Now, we're talking 300,000 infected devices wow. at this point, by the way. Wow. A that system third has of a, a big network. A third of a million, partly due to new exploitation modules. So it's evolving also. Its purpose remains unknown. Kaspersky says we haven't seen it being used in any type of attack or malicious activity. Its real purpose remains unknown. And Rad Radware's write-up provided some additional interesting technical details. They said the distributed bot network used for command and control and updating is overlaid as a traceless torrent on top of of the well-known public BitTorrent peer-to-peer network using dynamic info hashes that change on a daily basis. All communications through BitTorrent are signed and encrypted using RC4 with public and private keys. The current extension module provides scan and loader services to discover and infect new victims. The efficient SIN scanner implementation scans for open ports on TCP port 23 and TCP 5358. Upon discovering open telnet ports, the extension module tries to exploit the victim using brute force shell login, much the same way Mirai did. For this purpose, Hey Jimmy uses a list of consisting of the 61 factory default passwords from Mirai and adds two new entries, root slash, root is the uh, username, five up is the password, and admin 
as the username and five up as the password, which are factory defaults for Atheros wireless routers and access points. In addition, Hey Jimmy is capable of exploiting Eris modems using the password of the day backdoor with the default seed as outlined here. Hey Jimmy does not rashly follow a fixed sequence of credentials from Radware's honeypot log logs. Uh, they were able to conclude that the credentials used an exploit change depending on the login banner of the victim. I mean, this thing is top drawer. In doing so, Hey Jimmy increases its chances of successfully exploiting the device within a limited set of attempts to avoid the system account being locked out or its IP being blacklisted for a set amount of time. Radware also suggested that the flexible and extensible nature of the Hey Jimmy botnet would allow it to be used for malicious purposes, including conducted real-time mass surveillance from internet-connected webcams. However, since Hey Jimmy has no persistence mechanism, as soon as the infected device is rebooted, it goes back to its previously unsecured state with default passwords and the Telnet port open to the world. Now, there's no evidence of this, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if this is, I mean, I would be happy in a way if this was the NSA. That is, here we have a situation where Mirai brought down Dyn DNS last year because so many of these IoT devices were infected that 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 a hugely powerful what was it it was 600 gig or something a ridiculous amount of traffic w was able to be generated so now along comes a botnet which you cannot take down that uses high-end torrent encrypted uh, BitTorrent system uh, intercommunication with rotating password of the day seed-based passwords that protects the devices it infects from subsequent infection, um, stays in RAM, doesn't hurt them, doesn't destroy them, but takes them essentially out of service and is, due to its, its architecture, incredibly hard to kill. This feels like a well, I mean, and, and at the same time, <laughs> is a massive surveillance network should the owner of this network choose to exploit these IoT devices. We, we've never seen any evidence of this. And, and, you know, examine reverse engineering of the implant demonstrates all it does is rapidly find other vulnerable devices, presumably those that have been recently rebooted and reinfects them, them with it as you know, before anybody else can find them in order to essentially cleanse this otherwise very worrisome IOT install base of this latent problem. Uh, this to me, this feels like a, a state actor who's, uh, solving this IOT problem for us. So does it give you any clues that Hajime is <laughs> Japanese? It's the first name of a boxing manga series, comic book series, Hajime no Ippo. Well, and, and I don't know who named it. So, you know, ah. so, so, uh, yeah. well, maybe they so, saw that text string in there or something like that. Could be. I, I did not. Uh, find any reference to where the name came from. Anybody in the chat room speak Japanese? Does Hajime mean anything in Japanese? Hmm. Oh, I do know what it meant because I looked it up this morning when I w when I got the pronunciation. But uh, I don't know. I, I don't like remember. Hey Jimmy. Hey Jimmy. <laughs> oh, Hey Jimmy. How are you? Good to so, see you. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, we're all familiar it with, means the, with the beginning in Japanese. Beginning, ah, interesting. It's, it's a 
It's a Japanese martial arts term. That's scary. <laughs> yeah, it is a little. So we're all familiar with the concept of a, of a breathalyzer, where if law enforcement pulls you over when you're driving and believes that maybe you are intoxicated, traditionally you could blow into this device and it would register your current blood alcohol level as indicated by the alcohol content in your expiration. Well, NPR reports that legislation has passed in New York, which uh, may pave the way for a textilizer. Uh, they write, if you're one of the many who text, read email, or view Facebook on your phone while driving, be warned. Police in your community may, see, may, may soon have a tool for catching you red-handed. The new textilizer technology is modeled after the breathalyzer, except it's not, and would determine if you had been using your phone illegally on the road. Lawmakers in New York and a handful of other cities and states are considering allowing a poli the police to use the device to crack into phones because they say too many people get away with texting and driving and causing crashes. I'm going to skip a bunch of this reporting, which is about a personal story of somebody who who was involved in a distracted driver uh, crossing the center line and causing an accident that resulted in a death and how difficult it was to generate probable cause to get a subpoena to uh, to pull the records. Um, but uh, and skipping down, it says, uh, even though. New York and most other states ban texting and other kinds of cell phone, cell phone use while driving. This individual, Lieberman, says those lawsuits are difficult to enforce. The takeaway is our current law is a joke. Lieberman, among with, along with the advocacy group he co-founded, has been working with a company, and we know them, Celebrite, which are, the, of course, oh, the people who uh -huh, – They make those which, cell phone suckers. Exactly. Celebrite has been developing the textilizer. It would be able to determine whether a driver illegally was using a phone in the moments before a crash. Celebrite engineer Lee, and here's a name, Papa Th 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 Thanasu, P-A-P-A-T-H-A-N-A-S-I-O-U. Yeah, that's Greek. Papa Thanasu. Papa Thanasu. Papa. Papa Thanasu. Papa Thanasu. Demonstrated the device for lawmakers who could finally pronounce his name and reporters <laughs> at the New York State Capitol in Albany earlier last week. He says a police officer just goes to the driver and attaches a cord to connect the device to the phone. The driver doesn't even have to let go of the device. Papathanasu said, quote, they simply tap one button. It will process for about 90 seconds or so, then display what the last activities were. Again, that could be a text message and so on, but also web acti activity and touchscreen use with a timestamp. The device would display a summary of what apps on the phone were open and in use, he says, as well as screen taps and swipes. Quote, for example, if it was a WhatsApp message or a call, it will indicate what the source was, the timestamp, and then what the direction of the communication was. So if it was an outgoing call versus an incoming call. Papathanasu says the technology still is not yet fully developed but would be tailored to what's legal in each jurisdiction that approves its use. And he insists that the textilizer would only capture taps and swipes to determine if a driver was using the phone, that we would not download content, and that it would be able to tell if the driver was using a phone legally, hands-free. In New York, the bill authorizing police to use the textilizer has passed 
out of one committee and is pending in the next. Lawmakers are interested in the device in New Jersey and Tennessee and Chicago, as well as other cities, and they, as they consider ways to get drivers to focus on the road instead of their phones. So uh, I'm a little suspicious of whether they can pull this off because, um, you know, they've demonstrated success in getting into phones, but at least at the, at the moment, that's not something that the phones support. Although this is one of those things where you might, it might not be surprising to see that kind of technology officially enabled in phones, uh, for exactly this kind of purpose. I don't know, but wow. I, we do know that this distracted driving is a real issue. I look at cars weaving on the road, and we've talked here many times about how lights will turn green and <laughs> no one's car moves. Right? Is they're, they're all taking a time out, uh, and they go, oh, 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 that and then they off off they go. Yeah. Wow. Um, we we know we have SaaS S A A S software as a service now. We there is RAS, R A A S, ransomware as a service. Yes, for just $195, $175, a new ransomware service on offer from a Russian speaking user uh, is re reputed to be a boon to less technically capable cyber criminals. Going by the name Carmen, K A R M E N, anyone can deploy this easy-to-use drop-in ransomware kit without any need to understand how it works. The security firm Recorded Future posted last week that a Russian-speaking user called DevBitox, D-E-V-B-I-T-O-X, has been advertising the ransomware in underground forums. Carmen, the name of this ransomware, is part of a worrisome new trend known as ransomware as a service. It allows less technically skilled amateur hackers with little technical know-how to inexpensively purchase access, in return for which they receive a complete suite of web-based tools to develop their own ransomware attacks. In Carmen's case, it offers an easy-to-use dashboard interface Buyers can modify the ransomware, view what machines are infected, and see how much they've earned. Yeah, I guess it was inevitable, but uh, it's ransomware is going to be with us for the foreseeable future. Um, and finally, the, FT, the FCC has announced its plan to reverse Title II's enforced net neutrality. Um, the Verge reported, and this has got heavy coverage, the Federal Communications Commission is cracking open the net neutrality debate yet again with a proposal to undo the 2015 rules that implemented net neutrality with Title II classification. FCC's chairman, uh, Ajit Pai, called the rules... The, that is the rules enacted in 2015. So we have a new FCC chairman in the Trump administration calling these rules heavy handed and said their implementation was, quote, all about politics. So I guess that may be true. He argued that they hurt investment and said that small Internet providers don't have, quote, the means or the margins to withstand the regulatory onslaught. <laughs> okay. Ajit Pai said last Wednesday, earlier today, I shared with my fellow commissioners a proposal to reverse the what he called the mistake of Title II classification and return to the light touch framework that served us so well, as he put it, during the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, and the first six years of the Obama administration. The Verge writes, his proposal will do three things. First, it'll reclassify Internet providers as Title I information services, which I happen to think is a mistake. Second, 
it'll prevent the FCC from adapting any net neutrality rules to practices that Internet providers haven't thought up yet. And third, it'll open questions about what to do with several key net neutrality rules, like no blocking or throttling of apps and websites that were implemented and put in place in 2015. Pai said the full text of his net neutrality proposal would be published, and presumably it was on last Thursday afternoon, because this statement came out on last came out last Wednesday. It'll be voted on uh, by on uh, it'll be voted on by the FCC at a meeting on May 18th, so a little more than two weeks from today. From there, months of debate will follow as the item is opened up for public comment. And I think all of us listening need to take advantage of this and and you know make sure that our our representatives in Washington know what we feel about this. The commission will then revise its rules based on the feedback it receives. Let's hope that's true uh, before taking a final vote to enact them. Uh, and then the verge continues. Strong net neutrality rules were passed in 2015 and have been in place for about two years. Those rules reclassified Internet providers as common carriers under Title II of the Telecommunications Act, which subject them to tough utility style regulations. Amen. The FCC has previously mandated under Title II that Internet providers follow a few key rules. No blocking of sites and apps, no throttling the speed of sites and apps, and no paid fast lanes. The rules applied to both wired and wireless internet providers and also gave the commission oversight of interconnect agreements between the internet providers and big content companies like Netflix. Internet providers have, of course, been unhappy about this as they'd rather not have the FCC looking over their shoulder and limiting what they're able to do with their network. They sued to overturn the rules but so far, the rules have held up in court, but they not. But that may not last. So, once again, you know, we have all of us little folks who are trying to keep the internet open. Yet we have major, you know, huge, well-financed, deep-pocket ISPs that that say they need the flexibility to do with their traffic what they want. You know, they're, they're wanting to be considered information providers rather than common carriers. And to, to my thinking, that maybe a solution would be for them to bifurcate. If they, wanna, if they wanna do some things, then split themselves into half so that there's a common carrier portion that carries the traffic and then an adjunct that can offer content. But mixing these things together is just a recipe for trouble. And I just hope there is yet again another very loud out, outcry for for keeping things as they are and keeping our ISPs regulated under Title II. Yeah, we we and, fixed this last time. Tom Wheeler wasn't going to do this, this chairman I know. at the time. And uh, he opened it for comment and, and mi literally more than a million comments. Yep. And it convinced him of the merit of choosing Title II. Uh, that and the president's urging that he do so. Um, I don't. I think we're in a different climate, so we'll see what happens. But uh, yeah. we can make those millions of comments again. I think we need. Yeah, to. it's absolutely worth doing to yep. to revoice our yep. position. Yep. Um, Cloudflare, who, as our listeners know, has become a sponsor of the Twit Network mm -hmm. Netcast, has launched a new service, and I don't completely understand it, uh, but I'm sure we will with time. It's called Orbit. Uh, you can find out there's a short write-up at www.cloudflare.com slash orbit, O-R-B-I-T. And it is a new service to protect IoT devices. Uh, in, uh, in their write-up, they said, technology is changing, shifting towards a world where low-cost connected chips power products used by billions of people around the world. Everything from jet turbines and oil rigs to cars, cameras, and clothing are coming online. 
And while these tiny chips unlock incredible potential, they are a liability, if not secure, to which I add, amen. <laughs> when PC vulnerabilities are discovered, they write, software vendors issue a patch, which end users are required to download and install. These patches keep PC software up to date and secure. IoT devices also require patches, but the PC security model cannot scale to 22 billion devices. IoT manufacturers often haven't built over the air update mechanisms and are terrified that updates will brick a user's device. In the meantime, consumers never think about having to upgrade their internet-connected toaster, Cloudflare has in quotes. Cloudflare Orbit solves this problem at the network level by creating a secure and authenticated connection between an IoT device and its origin server. Orbit takes the internet out of IoT. Behind Orbit, devices are, and then they have iStar OT. Orbit allows device manufacturers to instantly deploy virtual patches and block vulnerabilities across all devices on the network simultaneously. In other words, Cloudflare is imposing, this is me speaking, Cloudflare is imposing itself as a big proxy serving, a proxy server network in between the all of these IoT devices and the public internet or the server that is intended to serve the IoT devices that exists on the public internet. And then going back to what they say, this keeps malicious requests from reaching devices. Buys time for IoT manufacturers to carefully QA their updates and keeps devices from leaking data or launching DDoS attacks. Uh, and, uh, and, and I should, I should mention also that that also allows them, that allows Cloudflare to put up firewall rules instantly to close ports or filter traffic which are discovered to be vulnerable for IoT devices. And it uses mutual authentication with client-side TLS certificates. We, of course, are always talking about server authentication, where the server contains a signed certificate that asserts its identity. Um, they're suggesting the use of client-side certificates. Now, this, of course, is questionable because you, you want to keep your certificates private. And it's not clear how an IoT device can keep its, can inherently keep its certificate private. For example, you know, GRC and any public server goes to great lengths to keep its private key, which is in its, its certificate, private. Um, so I don't know how you enforce that. It's, it's, a, a, it's an increase in security. Uh, a spokesman for Cloudflare said, quote, Orbit sits one layer before the device and provides a shield of security. So even if the device is running past its operating system's expiration date, Cloudflare protects it from exploits. And while devices may be seldom patched, the Cloudflare security team is shipping code every day, adding new firewall rules to Cloudflare's edge. Orbit and this is something I didn't know, but it's already in place. Orbit has been built in collaboration with a number of IoT vendors and already protects over 120 million IoT devices. It allows IoT companies to write logic on Cloudflare's edge and create firewall rules that are immediately updated to the Cloudflare Orbit layer for all devices without having to write and ship a patch. Um, and I noted that, uh, is it e e Eros? Eero, E-E-R-O? Eero. Eero. Those devices are being protected oh, by nice. Cloudflare Orbit. Another sponsor of ours. Yeah. All the sponsors are working together. I like it. 
Yeah. So so this this is not something that can be added afterwards. That is, this needs to be, you know, a an IoT vendor would need to decide they want to take it. They want to take advantage of this service, and so they would work with Cloudflare to to so essentially Cloudflare sort of becomes a CDN for IoT firmware and also an internet proxy to to for the IoT device to hide behind so that so that it creates essentially Cloudflare is is giving IoT vendors their scalability in order to provide useful services and features to internet connected devices which i think sounds like a really cool idea so it's not something that a, that an end user uh, needs to worry about but it's something that iot device manufacturers it's a service they could use with cloudflare to enhance the security of their iot devices Fantastic. so you know cheesy things aren't going to bother but but devices that care about security and are pro- wanting to to use this as as a as a as a value added benefit uh, could avail themselves of this. Nice. So, bravo to Cloudflare and those those device vendors who choose to use it. Um, and I just did want to mention that Mozilla and Chrome are continuing their back and forth with Symantec. I read through a mind numbing. <laughs> dialogue of you know we said this and they said this and then then they proposed this and we read that and then we proposed that uh semantic is of course pushing back as fiercely as possible and wanting to do as little as possible and this of course is as we've discussed in the previous podcast in co- in response to uh, rather gross violations of the of the responsibility of a ca which Chrome and Fire and Mozilla have both decided they're going to take action on that they're not going to let this stand. You know things like removing EA certificate certificate issuance completely, uh, enforcing short certificates moving forward until Symantec proves and, and takes you know clear measures to demonstrate that they that they are that they will be responsible moving forward. And so forth. So, uh, browsers, the browser vendors are attempting to both appear and be understanding and reasonable, while also feeling that their true responsibility lies with their users, who are inherently trusting their browsers to keep them safe. So, I mean, this is one of those situations where there's going to be pain, and now there is an ongoing struggle uh, to decide where that line gets drawn. So I just did want to mention this is ongoing. I'm kind of keeping an eye on it, and, but we don't have any conclusions yet. Um, some bits of errata. Uh, Erwin Wessels uh, shot me a tweet saying, there are not individual emojis for each skin tone variety. They're modifiers slash ligatures. And so that, ca- that prompted me. So thank you, first of all, Erwin. That prompted me to dig in a little bit. And believe it or not, we now have herb emoji racial diversity. Uh, it is it is in the Unicode spec under diversity, if you can believe that. Of course, we had the original sort of Smurf yellow emojis that those, those are the ones I had always used. And I I misstated last week. That now we had, we had like an explosion of emojis, at, and that, but apparently we the, the the Unicode space was big enough to accommodate them. And we also talked last week about yes, there are what 17 million, uh, more than 17 million. Um, wait, no, it was 17 planes of 65k. I can't, I, I don't remember now how many million, but there was like plenty of of Unicode space. Well, it turns out that what was actually done was that a skin tone modifier was added to the Unicode spec quite some time ago. 
in Unicode version eight back in mid 2015. And there, so we, we still have the original Smurf yellow, but then we have five human skin tones ranging from, you know, white through dark, uh, you know, kind of light white to dark brown. And that's a, that's an escape character essentially, which can be appended to any of the existing Smurf yellow emojis to turn them into one of five skin tones. So, uh, thank you for the correction. And I was, I find that kind of interesting. Um, oh, also I misspoke when I referred to the eternal blue and eternal, you know, the various eternal star things and double parsar, double pulsar as being vault seven, thus CIA leaks. I, I meant to say, and they are from the NSA's uh, equation group, uh, which was released by shadow brokers. And I think you actually corrected me, Leo, but somebody else uh, no, no, noted that as well. Actually, several listeners. So thank you for that. And then this is not quite a rata, but <laughs> this is under the category of there's got to be a simpler way to say that. Uh, uh, Joel Dittmer uh, quoted me uh, regarding uh, puny code. He, say, he said, classic at SGGRC. Apparently, I said, I don't disagree that this was never not a bad idea. What? I don't double disagree. Double negative. That this was never not a bad idea. Is that a double or a triple? Anyway. Never not a bad idea is a good idea. Don't, I don't disagree that was this always, was never not a bad idea. It was idea. always a good idea. It's a never yeah. not a bad idea. So... So there, <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. Anyway, under miscellany, I did want to point our listeners to badssl.com, a cool and quick little website that checks your browser client for its feature set, shows whether it supports, continues to support old things that it should not, whether it supports new good things. You need to, it's not quite obvious when you bring up the page, you need to click on something in order to make it run the tests. Then a bunch of things spin around and then it shows you what your browser uh, is doing. So badssl.com. And at the bottom of that page, they remind us about uh, that our friend Ivan Ristic, also at, over at ssllabs.com, has a very nice client side SSL test with a number of different features as well. Um, I talked about the idea of bringing up a VPN on Amazon's EC2, and I just saw as we were starting the podcast that there's a formal project for that, but, there's, but, the, but there is that, but there's also you're able to set up a proxy server so that you can run all of your stuff through an Amazon EC2 uh, VPC instance. Um, so I've got a, I just wanted to make a note of that and, and the, the link for the, the, the steps to do that, just 10 steps you run through is on GitHub. Um, several people said after my mentioning chromosome, my, the very first thing I wrote for windows, what I, the, the tool that I used to teach me how to program windows, uh, he, uh, James, I guess it's, uh, James Bong said, I desperately need to play around with Chromosome. How do I get it? Many other people said the same thing. I, I'll publish it all publicly. I'll bring, I'll put that page back online and put links to the code so people who can set a machine to 256 color mode uh, can play with it. I'd, I'd be happy to have people do so. I, I'm really proud of it. It's sort of my masterpiece of Windows programming. And now, Leo. <laughs> I'm ready. Two minutes of... Uh, Technically, completely accurate. This is not gibberish as the Turbo and Tabulator was. But, and I know our listeners will love this because it is technically accurate description of missile guidance. But and it is wonderful. So everybody, <laughs> listen up. The missile knows where it is at all times. It knows this because it knows where it isn't. By subtracting where it is from where it isn't, or where it isn't from where it is, whichever is greater, it obtains a difference or deviation. The guidance subsystem uses deviations to generate corrective commands to drive the missile from a position where it is to a position where it isn't, 
and arriving at a position where it wasn't, it now is. Consequently, the position where it is, is now the position that it wasn't, and it follows that the position that it was, is now the position that it isn't. In the event that the position that it is in is not the position that it wasn't, the system has acquired a variation. The variation being the difference between where the missile is and where it wasn't. Mm. If variation is considered to be a significant factor, it too may be corrected by the GEA. However, the missile must also know where it was. <laughs> the missile guidance computer scenario works as follows. Because a variation has modified some of the information the missile has obtained, it is not sure just where it is. However, it is sure where it isn't, within reason, and it knows where it was. It now subtracts where it should be from where it wasn't, or vice versa. And by differentiating this from the algebraic sum of where it shouldn't be and where it was, it is able to obtain the deviation and its variation, which is called error. It's just algebra. <laughs> Very straightforward. Oh, yes. So, <laughs> anyway, I loved uh, the the uh, how how pedan pedantic that is, and it's uh, technically it's correct. Accurate. So yeah, it's just x one minus x two. Yeah. In the show notes, and I, I tweeted this is something that does not work over the podcast, uh, over an audio podcast, but it it believe me. It is so good. Four minutes and ten seconds. Uh, the Cookie Monster, the Muppets Cookie Monster, consuming a machine as it describes itself. Somebody, and, somebody said this is actually uh, Ed Sullivan. Oh, it, and it's I had no old. idea yeah. that the Cookie Monster could be so descriptive. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is this is the Ed Sullivan show. I get it. External components already. <laughs> Let us begin. <laughs> At the upper right of the modular system console, you will note the longitudinally polarized antenna, resulting in a completely unitized composite sheath. This unique design is virtually indestructible. And is yeah, you really should watch the video. The life of the unit. Uh, uh. <laughs> the longitudinally polarized antenna Jim Henson. That's great. That's pre Muppets show, I think. There is an alarm system located next to the antenna, which rings if any portion of this machine is damaged. If this alarm rings, the only way it can be silenced is by locating the origin of the malfunction. <laughs> <It's eating it. laughs> now immediately adjacent to the alarm is the digital iambic generator this is probably the most valuable component in the entire system and as such it should be handled with extreme care <laughs> again if you were to breaking look inside this unit you would find a string of delicately balanced h14 analog capacitators <laughs> It takes over 185 man hours to produce a capacitor because each one must be painstakingly assembled with a 301 electromicrometer. He's eating it. These capacitors are connected into the dual exhaust intake valve. The quantum polarization of the energy transfer involved herein results in the emission of a small amount of gaseous methane. <laughs> Which is <laughs> all right. You get the idea. <laughs> I, I encourage. I encourage uh, our viewers. Uh, it is listeners. so. It is so good. It's yeah, just it's so it's fabulous. Yeah. And, yeah. And and it's got a punchline. It keeps going and it gets better. So uh, it really it's worth. It. I tweeted it. And again, Google Muppets Analytical Computer. Yeah. You Google Muppets Analytical Computer, you'll find it. Wow. wow. Uh, an another listener. Uh, tweeted, got the first Frontier Saga book. Let me tell you, wow, amazing. And I haven't been able to put it down. And that echoes the sentiments I'm getting from many of our listeners. So I'm I'm glad to have another uh, recommendation that people are enjoying. And I heard you refer to it also over the weekend. Yeah, John's right? been reading it. I bought it on the you know the the cheap three volumes on Kindle. Although I notice it is uh, available on Audible. So. If I like it, I might I might go to the. I think versions. you played it. It was a little nasally for yeah, you. Yeah, you didn't like the right. you didn't like the yeah. guy who was reading yeah. it. I'm enjoying um, reading it. I need occasionally I need to read pa letters on uh, paper or something like paper. 
Yeah. 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 Um, Brett Longborough is a long-term Twitter uh, finder and sender. I recognize his name. Anyway, he said, hi, Steve. After years of shameless freeloading off a, sp- off a friend's spin right, today I purchased my own copy. Thanks and apologies. Brett, no apology needed. You're legit. And I'm glad to have you. And you'll be able to play with 6-1 during its early pre-release uh, stages as well, uh, as, well as, ev- as will everyone who has, uh, who has six at the time. And, uh, uh, gee, I don't know how to pronounce this. N. N. Grippeman <laughs> said uh, at SGGRC, Spinright saved my database server. RAID 1 disk failed, used SR to bring drive back to life, made backup, got new drives, restored from backup. Wow, that's like a whole novel in 140 characters. <laughs> a beginning, a middle, and an end. Got Conflict, the whole, resolution. The whole thing. The whole, whole thing. The whole thing. I'm thinking Engineer Pi Man. Oh, nice. But I don't know. It's like reading uh, license plates, right? Yeah, it is. E-N-G-R-P-I-M-A-N. And then four little uh, bits of feedback from our listeners closing the loop. Uh, John, Mr. John Morris, said, listening to SN607 and thought I'd share the re- the reality of Chrome cookie settings, not respecting settings. And then he sent me a photo where actually it was two side by side photos where he showed he had disabled cookies in Chrome or third party cookies or first, you know, some cookies and then went over and looked at them and found them. And and I was familiar with this. I wrote back to him and I wanted to share with our listeners. Some browsers will continue to store but not to send cookies. Some will even continue to receive an update but not, but not store or not, I'm sorry, but I, I, I actually meant, but not send cookies. This is exactly why I created that cookie forensics page. Because one, if, if you look there, you'll notice it shows like how stale the cookies are. We were talking about this a couple of weeks ago. We were talking about stale cookies because sometime, because back, back, back then when I created it, sometimes you could turn off cookies and some browsers would send the old cookies they had but wouldn't update them newly, so then they were stale. Some browsers continued to update them but didn't send them. So the fact that the browser has still has the cookie and didn't delete it doesn't mean that it's still sending it, but, but it may just have it. And then when you, if you were then to re-enable cookies, it would, it would immediately start sending the cookies that it had. The point is, this is very complex, or potentially very complex and unintuitive behavior. But the cookie forensics page, because it actually runs through multiple cycles of exchanging cookies back and forth and analyzes the whole set of transactions, it's able to weed everything out and then summarize everything for exactly the way the browser is working. So it's it's not you can't it's not something you can statically inspect. You need to to see how it actually acts, um, you know, uh, in vitro or vivo, wherever that would be. <laughs> um, uh, Richard Hardy uh, tweeted, "Watching the Security Now double pulsar uh, episode, I had a thought about the port four four five being. Um, oh, I had a thought about the port four five." being open, what about PCs uh, in a DMZ? And so that's a very, like, oh, so so he, so the point was, I was wondering, how could there be so many systems with 445 open? And he notes, well, if you set up a DMZ on your router, by definition, unsolicited incoming traffic is not dropped, it's sent to that IP. And it's true. It, if you then had a machine that either didn't have its own local firewall running, and probably 445 would have to be a Windows machine or a Linux machine that had, that had Samba running on it. If it didn't have a firewall or did have 445 open, then yes, that would, it would be vulnerable to the SMB. The good news is all Windows systems since Windows XP SP2 
have had a have a have a software firewall in and enabled by default. So even that would protect you unless something on the machine had poked a hole on it or through it on purpose. So again, the DMZ is worth noting because that does certainly create a vulnerability to the machine that is the the recipient of unsolicited traffic. It's like very much like having it on the public internet, uh, but at least Windows machines where the 445 port problem is the most acute probably are protected themselves. Joan tweeted, there are ads related to my location popping up on my Facebook feed. How do I stop this if setting up a VPN isn't enough? And, and Joan, I guess I would refer you back to our podcast a couple weeks ago um, about the real privacy protection. Uh, the second one where we actually finally made time to get to that because this is the problem is that even if you VPN, then where you go still knows who you are because that's conveyed through your cookies. So what you would need to do would be to turn on incognito browsing and VPN so that your IP would change and your browser would then respect your privacy in a, in the whatever the, your browser's version of incognito mode is, um, then you should not be known. So those two things, turning on incognito mode and use a VPN, that'll suddenly your IP will change and your browser should then, I mean, maybe fingerprinting would still be a problem of the browser. I'm not sure uh, browser by browser how good a job they do, but they'll at least block cookies so that you are no longer logged in and you're, the places you go don't obviously know who you still are, even though you're coming from a different location, which is the only thing that VPN really does for you is just shift your location to uh, the the where, where the VPN's public presence is. You can and, also, in many cases, oh. the browser has a setting for location sharing. Uh, that You should do that and everything you just mentioned. Correct. Because if the browser's <laughs> giving up your, your information, you kind of <laughs> right. doesn't matter what you do. That's a very good point. What, what, uh, I've got mine set up. I don't know if it's the default, but mine sometimes I go to asks, web pages, right? Yes, and, yeah. and they prompt. You know, yeah. do you want this site and, to know where you are? It's you like, can no. in the settings then go look and see who's got permission and who you know who doesn't, and you can change right. the settings. Say you know, never do it. Yeah, nice. And lastly, finally, Nate G says he actually in a pair of tweets the biggest roadblock with getting friends and family on board with a password vault solution has been the master password. Any suggestions? And he continued, my wife, for example, sees the benefit of them, but has had problems remembering a high entropy password in the past, unwilling to try again now. And so, you know, empathizing with him, I said, I, I wrote back and I said, Nate, best advice would be to use maybe, for example, Five memorable real words with one deliberate misspelling. Not the best solution possible, but not a bad compromise. I'll so, tell you what I do. Okay. That I find very easy, and I tell people to do this. If you have a poem memorized or a song lyric memorized, let's say the Jabberwocky. T'was brillig and the slithy toe did gyre and gimble in the wabe. You don't want to use the words, but you could use the first initials of right. each word, uh, perhaps adding punctuation and uppercase and lowercase letters, depending on some arbitrary rule that you conceive of. Or maybe even a comma where there would be a pause. That's what I would recommend. I don't want to say what I do, but that's what I would recommend. <laughs> and then to make it long and strong, I then add numbers, either say a child, some number that you remember, you know, the one I always tell people is a childhood phone number, because that's something you probably is not on record anywhere, but it's something you also memorized as a child, right? That was like the most important, or your childhood zip code or address, or th that gives you an additional padding. Yep. Um, and, and the two combined, I think would be fairly strong. I think that's good. And I'll bet that after a while you begin to memorize it. 
I, I've got some gibberish that I've been using yeah. for, well, that's true, for you know, in yeah. safe places for quite a while. And I just type it without even thinking now. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. <laughs> you know, you, people memorize stuff. And, uh, you yeah. know, there, there's usually a phrase or two. And wh what's the length? I would say, you know, 15 to 20, right? Just keep going until you have 20 words. And then yeah, add a say, phone number. Yep. Shorter than the Canadian national anthem. <laughs> You heard me trying to remember that. <laughs> well, if you remember, but there's a good example. If you remember the national anthem, maybe not yours, some other country's national anthem, that'd be a perfect example because in your head, you could actually sing it and type your password. Not the words, just the initials. I think the words might be a little bit brute forceable. I don't know. Do you think bad guys have initial brute forcers? I, I think that in general, the password vaults are like as we know are, are are generally safer against brute force yeah for example we know that last pass does a strong what is it 500 5, or 000, more now i think uh iteration PBK, 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 yeah. DF, yes yeah. and so you know it makes it difficult to brute force even if brute even force if, it. if it were a bad password right so it's certainly yes so it's certainly better to use a bad password with a password vault than than like I mean, th this makes me wonder how good the passwords Nate's wife is using in general are. Yeah. If she's, you know, she's probably using like not, you know, I mean, the the, the vault al allows you to just reduce it to a single one gnarly password. But frankly, the the attack profile is such that it doesn't have to be that gnarly, you know, yeah. that gnarly. Yes. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. And then turn on two factor. And then it's really gnarly, right? Because yep, yeah, yep, that and would be perfect. LastPass supports that, so that's why I always do that too. Steve, we're done. Oh my goodness! Oh, that was a <laughs> that was a quinti venti latte day. If I big ever... <laughs> bad news week. Wow, what? <laughs> lots of it. Uh, well, we'll do it again. How about this? You think there'll be enough to do a show next week? Oh, I'm afraid there will be. <laughs> Patch Tuesday. If if nothing, following up on some of these nightmares. <laughs> We do the show uh, every Tuesday, 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 Eastern, 20.30 UTC. Stop by, say hi, watch live. It's everywhere on our website, uh, twit.tv slash live. YouTube uh, has it, youtube.com slash twit. Ustream, Twitch. We all have Twit channels. Uh, and then join the chat room, too, irc.twit.tv, because that's like the cool kids in the back. And they and there's a lot of you know I don't you don't watch the chat room I know you've been in the chat room many times but you don't watch it during the show, but there always there's always lots of stuff, you know comments, it's great, research. Uh, if you can't watch live on demand audio and video is always available at our site and Steve's got audio and uniquely he's got uh, human transcribed transcriptions of the show. Elaine Ferris does a great job. So you can go there and read along with Steve. And you know, while you're there, pick up a copy of Spinrite. It wouldn't hurt you to give give Steve a little money, support him. GRC.com. He's got a lot of free stuff there too. And then you wouldn't feel guilty using that and listening to the show, right? And uh, we'll be back next and week. And you'll be able to get the pre-release of 6-1 mm -hmm. as it's coming along mm -hmm. before, before everybody else. And is it coming along? As soon as Squirrel's behind me, <laughs> and we're making great progress on Good. Squirrel. Good. It's going to get that Squirrel back. <laughs> if you're just tuning in, you, have the, you don't worry. Just hang out with us a little while. It'll all make sense. <laughs> squirrel. <laughs> squirrel. 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 Thanks, squirrel. Steve. We'll see you next time on Security Now. Thanks, Leo. Security. Now.